Good evening and welcome to Running from Alaska Public Media and KTOO. I'm Nat Herz, a reporter with Alaska Public Media, and I'll be the host for the first night of our program, which features debates between candidates in four different races for seats in the Alaska legislature. Andrew Kitchenman will take over tomorrow. Things are obviously a little bit different this year with the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'm hosting here at the Alaska Public Media Studio, but our candidates will be appearing through the Zoom platform, which sounds weird, but I promise this is actually gonna be awesome, so just hang with us. We're gonna hear from candidates in four legislative races tonight. Uh, obviously, we would have liked to hear from each legislative district across the state, but my bosses would not let me host 25 debates. So we narrowed it down a little bit, looking at things like fundraising, primary results, how competitive districts are, and geographic diversity. We'll continue covering important developments and issues in all the races across the state over the next month leading up to the election. Tonight, three of the races we are featuring are for House seats, but the first one is for the Senate District that includes a big chunk of South and East Anchorage, plus Indian, Girdwood, and Portage. The seat is now filled by Alaska Senate President Kathy Giesel, but she lost resoundingly in the Republican primary last month to Roger Holland, who's here with us for tonight's program. Holland is a former member of the U.S. Coast Guard. He also worked for the Alaska Department of Transportation as a metrologist, meaning he was charged with ensuring that DOT's scales and measuring equipment were working properly. I'm sure he'll correct me if I got that a little bit wrong. He's uh, lived in Alaska since 2009. Tonight's debate also includes Democratic candidate Carl Johnson. Johnson served in the Navy as a radar operator, and he says he's also worked as a jailer, an attorney, a subsistence analyst, and a tourism business owner. There are two other candidates in the race who are not appearing on our program tonight, independent Care Clift and Democratic write-in candidate Lynette Hins. The format for the debates will be an opening statement, four questions for each candidate, followed by a lightning round, which is really just hang on for that. Each candidate will have a minute to answer each question and we'll leave about a minute and a half for rebuttals after that. Uh, the best thing about being on the internet is that we don't have to stick to a tight schedule. So we'll start off with Mr. Holland's opening statement. Mr. Holland, your opening sta statement, one minute. Hey, you took all my stuff uh, in the intro. Um, so I came to Alaska in 2009. Um, I went to work for a, uh, a, a DOT, metrology lab. Um, I, my work history, I've worked about 10 years in the public sector, 10 years in the private sector. I actually worked about 10 years in academia. And for the last 30 years, I have been in the United States Coast Guard Reserve. I'm still in and I will retire out with them in December of 2020. Um, you know, at 58 years old, I never, I've never run for public office before. And about 10 months ago, I looked at what was happening in our state and I, I knew I would have to quit a perfectly good job if I chose this path. My wife and I discussed it and um, we knew it'd be a lot of work. Um, I announced on January 21st and then we all came to know COVID-19 and nothing was ever the same again. Um, our problems did not get any easier. Um, and uh, I'm still interested in going and trying to help do my part to fix what I can in Juneau. But uh, the, like I said, it's not getting any easier. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Johnson. Your opening statement, please, one minute. Thank you and good evening, everyone. I am currently a small business owner in the tourism industry. But as Nat mentioned, I did serve in the Navy and I did that because that was the only way to put myself through college and it also helped putting myself through law school. I moved to Alaska to work as an attorney, but I've also worked in natural resources management. Now I'm running because I wanna help build Alaska's future. We need an Alaska that creates opportunities and a government that provides essential services. We need to manage our permanent fund for long-term sustainability. I'm gonna fight for an Alaska where people will want to stay, not one that'll force them to leave to look for opportunities elsewhere. I'm willing to make the hard decisions that we need to make. I'm gonna to fight to ensure that the legislature serves as an independent check on the governor when his policies will hurt Alaskans. And I ask for your vote in the general election. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Okay, now we'll uh, start with our first question with uh, Mr. Holland. If elected, Mr. Holland, would you vote for a budget that spends extra money for the permit from the permanent fund? Uh, excuse me. Would you vote for a budget that spends extra money from the permanent fund's earnings reserve account beyond the five percent sustainable draw identified by the legislature, Mr. Holland? One minute. Well, um, so we're going to be short this year, one point five to two point six seven eight nine whatever billion dollars. Um, that is nothing unusual. We've been short. 
three billion dollars a year for every year for the last five or six years. And uh, yes, I do believe we are going to have to spend uh, what is available from the ERA. I'm not quite sure how the POMB will fit into that if that if there's any wiggle room on that. But uh, we do need to get our expenditures to match our revenues. And I'm afraid we will probably have to uh, spend some of the ERA uh, this year to get get there. We cannot do it this year. We have to have that target off in the future. Got it. Uh uh, thank you, Mr. Holland. Mr. Johnson, if you were elected, would you vote for a budget that fills the deficit with extra money from the permanent funds earnings reserve account beyond the sustainable draw identified by the legislature? One minute, Mr. Johnson. Well, first, let's talk about what's left in the earnings reserve. After funds are recommitted in next year's budget, we have $5.5 billion remaining in the earnings reserve. And I know that Mr. Holland wants to give everybody a payback on their PFDs, which would draw down our permanent fund earnings reserve to $4.7 billion, leaving only $800 million left. I think that we will have to draw money from that earnings reserve, but there's not enough to pay for the government services that we need. We are going to have to consider additional sources of revenue. I mean, this is a buck that's been passed for far too long. We've cut enough as we could. We've cut 50%, 4.5 billion over the last eight years out of the budget. And we're really starting to hit rock bottom on where we can cut for services that are essential, infrastructure, public safety, and education. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. So I'm gonna go back to uh, Mr. Holland for this follow-up question. Um, would you acknowledge that spending beyond the 5% POMV uh, limit adopted by the legislature, that that would reduce the buying power of the permanent fund for future generations? And if so, how would you justify uh, that step? Well, the, I mean, and I hear that, you know, every time you, I forget the number, you take 100 million out, it removes some number. I mean, people do that all the time. You go into your savings. Every time I have to go to my savings, like when we quit, when I quit my job to, to run, um, we, we dipped in our savings a little bit. Yeah, that that earnings power is not there, but it's it, people do it all the time. I mean, it's, uh, it's not an obstacle. What I'm concerned about is what are we limited to? Because there are, there are guide rails that will limit the amount that can be drawn out of the ERA. Gotcha. Okay. And I would go, uh, I would go back to Mr. Johnson with a quick follow-up. Um, I know that Mr. Holland, I think, has been pretty clear about his position on paying a statutory PFD, which would create a, a much larger deficit. Is that, uh, is that a step you support? And if not, do you, uh, do you have a number that you think is reasonable for the, for the dividend? I've got about 30 seconds left here. Well, the, the 1982 statute was affected by the Alaska Supreme Court's decision in 2017. So it basically makes the PFD to compete with other government services for funding. We have a law on the books that we should follow, but we also need to consider whether or not the law is still applicable given our current fiscal situation. And and Mr. Holland's right. His his plan for paying out $4.7 billion in a one-time payback of the PFD is going to cost us basically $5 billion over, over a 10 year period in compounded interest in perpetuity. Okay, um, we'll, we'll leave it there and uh, move on to our second question, starting with Mr. Johnson this time. Um, Mr. Johnson, the budget that the legislature approved this year relies on about a billion dollars in deficit spending. That goes up to more than $2 billion if you pay the permanent fund dividend under that traditional legal formula. Um, for the budget you'd be uh, working on if elected to the legislature, there will not be enough money in our last uh, savings account outside the earnings reserve. That's the constitutional budget reserve to cover that gap, even with a $1,000 PFD. Um, how should we be handling that problem, Mr. Johnson? One minute. Well, again, I, I don't believe that we should cut further in essential government services. That means we have to consider new revenue options. Anybody who tells you otherwise is either looking to destroy state government as we know it, or isn't being fully honest about our situation. So one of the concerns that was discussed at statehood was whether or not this state would be able to pay for itself or be a drain on the federal budget. So we have a constitutional method in, mechanism in place that allows us to manage our resources for sustainability and for maximum benefit of Alaskans. So we need to look at whether or not we're getting the full value of what we can for our natural resources, as far as taxes go, royalties, but also we need to consider seriously 
income or sales taxes. Now, ICER has done studies on this that compares the impacts of families on income taxes, sales taxes, and cutting the PFD. And cutting the PFD is far more damaging to Alaskan families than those other options. But we do have to take a large, hard look at the issue and do something. We've just been kicking the can too far down the road for too long. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Holland, uh, same question to you. There's a billion dollar deficit next year. If we pay a full permanent fund dividend, the deficit is up to more than $2 billion. Um, how do we pay for that, Mr. Holland? One minute. Well, um, you know, and, and I support the statutory PFD, but also support uh, the governor. And, um, and, and we're all just the outside looking in. We, no one really knows uh, from the outside where we'll be uh, till we get into Juno and start looking at this. But I tell you, 40 years ago, the state of Alaska started down this path where the size of our state budget was not at all tied to the ability of, this, of Alaskans to pay for it. And um, yes, protect essential services, but um, I do not believe that, um, I do believe there are more savings to be found in the budget. I mean, you just look at what we have right now, the Alaska Marine Highway System, which is a very important service, very important system in Alaska, but we have maybe two and a half of 12 ferries running right now. Um, I, we, we have, and I'm not a big believer in state layoffs, but we haven't let the first federal, I mean, a ferry employee person go. Um, it's uh, the, if we don't have boats to run, we're keeping the staff all on board waiting for the boats to show. You know what I mean? Th yeah, thank, um, there thank you. Thank uh, you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Holland, I guess I'll actually come back to you and ask you, I mean, do you support uh, further reductions in service to the Alaska Marine Highway System uh, as, as well as layoffs of, of workers to that service? Well, not further reductions in service because already we're down to two and a half ferries and we're stretching those ferries. It's an important service. We need to expand it back up. We need to get more boats running again, but we can't be charging people an income tax so we can have empty ferries running in the waters of Alaska. We, we cannot um, raise uh, taxes on oil field production uh, to keep empty ferries running. I mean, we have to revisit what we have done in the past in Alaska. We, we have to provide essential services, but we have to identify what those essential services are. Okay, so we'll, and then we'll, I guess we'll go back quickly to Mr. Uh, Mr. Johnson, excuse me. Um, wondering, uh, you mentioned that you, you know, think we need to at least seriously consider an income or sales tax. Um, if, if someone, uh, you know, someone said, you've got to pick one of those two choices that you prefer, uh, which one would it be and why? Well, it'd be nice if the Department of Revenue had studied this issue for us. Uh, I was able to find a study where they looked at what a sales tax could revenue but not one where they could generate uh, you know, projected revenue from an income tax. So we actually have to have the experts providing this information where we can make an informed decision. I mean, I, just, I, think, uh, I, think it's been, I think it's been studied. I mean, the Walker administration has studied it a fair amount. I mean, are you leaning one way or another? Well, if, if I had to pick between the two, I think a progressive income tax is less harmful to Alaskan families than a sales tax would be. Okay. It would be a lot more fair across the board. Okay. But uh, the important thing to to mention here is that any legislator who is going, who is pledging to, you know, who's running for office and ready to go to work in Juneau next year, if they say they're not willing to consider any revenue, then they're not considering seriously our fiscal problem. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Johnson. So now we'll move to question three. Um, Mr. Holland, what uh, in your mind is the most important thing that the legislature should do next year to help Alaskans through the COVID-19 pandemic, the most important single thing, one minute? Well, I'll tell you, it, it may come back to the, the permanent fund dividend, but uh, you know, we gotta get this economy rolling again. Uh, we, uh, we, it is a hard thing to think about, could we, could we uh, produce all the back pay for the permanent fund dividend? But you know, honestly, if we could cut the uh, checks for um, the $1,000 a month stimulus spending. This is money we have in the bank. It costs us about $600 uh, million every time we, uh, we run a $1,000 uh, PFD checkout. Um, we, we do have to get Alaskans back to work. We have to get our economy rolling again. We, we, we need to get the money back in the system. Gotcha, okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Holland. Mr. Johnson, the single most important thing that the legislature should do next year to help Alaskans through the COVID-19 pandemic, one minute. Well, first thing, 
both the legislature and the governor actually need to come up with a plan for an economic recovery from COVID-19. Uh, we've been focused so much on just getting through the pandemic as far as reestablishing businesses, but so much has been lost. So I think that's number one is developing a plan. It needs to be a priority. Now, one of the areas where we could start is in public works jobs. That could be shovel ready projects that are ready to go that can provide immediate work and long lasting benefits. I think we also need to work on diversifying our economy, making sure that we have enough types of industry that are operating that when one is hit, whether it's significantly from a global pandemic or from the price of oil dropping below $40 a barrel, the rest of the economy doesn't suffer. So I think careful planning is the way to go, but spending down our permanent fund earnings reserve, again, you know, spending uh, 1.5, I know that that Mr. Holland would suggested previously that he would have rejected COVID-19 aid from the federal government, just pay it out of the earnings reserve. But that is that is cash in a bank that will go away and be gone forever. So, so, and Mr. It so it's sustainable. Mr. Johnson, I'm I guess I'm going to actually circle back. I mean, you talked about uh, you know infrastructure investment and public works jobs. I mean, where where do you think that money should come from if not the earnings reserve? Is that something that you could see the state borrowing money for, bonding for? Uh, you know, where else would that money come from? I am open to any ideas that any of my fellow legislators are going to discuss. And the thing is. I'll be willing to talk with any legislator who has good ideas. It doesn't matter what party they're in. Okay, so then we'll quickly just go back to Mr. Holland. Did you did you say six hundred a thousand dollars a month or a thousand dollars a year as sort of a supplemental benefit? Well, this year the the uh, statutory PFD would have been thirty two hundred dollars, and so they paid nine hundred and ninety two dollars of it, I think. And that um, the if you just think about it, a thousand a month uh, for the next two months um, would be the statutory PFD th this year. It's There's no planning involved. The mechanism's in place. It's easy to do, and it's probably the right thing to do. If there were ever a crisis that warranted spending Alaskan, uh, but, uh, Alaskan funds in giving it to Alaskans, it's currently. We're, we're, we're losing businesses. I have a friend in Ketchikan who suggested there'd be 500 businesses closed in Ketchikan before Christmas. I mean, we are in a crisis situation right now. We do need to get Alaskans back to work. So you wouldn't necessarily endorse running that for a full year, like you would say? No, 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 okay. I'm sorry, no, no. The, 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 the thing we need to do though, is we do need to understand what the coronavirus is and, um, and, and move ahead. Um, there, the, there was some, uh, Glenn Beagle had talked about the pandemic bill of rights, which would be a great way, you know, restaurants used to have smoking and non-smoking uh, uh, zones. Uh, how about we just let the restaurants decide how much pandemic protection they're going to require patrons to use and let patrons choose which restaurants are going to go into, you know? So, we yeah, don't thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Holland. So now we'll move on to question four. Um, this is, uh, we'll start with Mr. Johnson. The state of Alaska owes about $750 million in cash tax credits to oil companies that spent money uh, drilling or exploring for oil here. Um, the Alaska Supreme Court just ruled recently that we couldn't borrow money to pay them back. Um, how should the state solve this problem? Uh, one minute, Mr. Johnson. Well, um, I, that's a tough one. Um, we already, we're already having deficit problems with things that we need, the things that are important for our economy, for infrastructure, public safety. And um, since we can't borrow money to pay back that, I think there's gonna have to be a serious restructuring of how those tax credits can be applied. It's, it's kind of a tough situation to step into as a new legislator to fix some serious messes from the past, but that's a, that's a big one. I don't have any specific solutions for that since that's such a relatively new issue. All right, uh, Mr. Johnson, thank you. We'll go to Mr. Holland. How should the state deal with the nearly $750 million in tax credits that the state owes to oil and gas companies? Once again, like I said, no easy answers, but we are a mineral resource revenue state, and um, we do have to honor our obligations. Um, you know, Governor Walker looked at a 6% income tax in 2015 that produced all of $200 million. Um, we will never be and income tax revenue state. We, it, it can't carry the burden of the budget like the uh, oil production revenue does. We need to honor that debt. 
Um, we need to uh, possibly restructure it, maybe spread it, spread it across the next two years or so. But, um, you know, the oil pays the bills here and uh, we need to protect that, that part of our economy, that big, huge part of our economy. Gotcha. Okay. Well, thanks, Mr. Holland. I think we'll come back to you on that one. I mean, you know, we we've heard a lot from you. I think about you know when you talk about your your um, hope to pay a statutory PFD. I know. I think you signed a pledge to pay back PFD money as well. Um, then you add in another seven hundred fifty million dollars. I mean, that's that's probably the majority, at least, of what's in the earnings reserve. Um, I mean. Can we can we really afford that? And is that really fiscally conservative? Well, to look at, I mean, fiscally conservative is to honor your debts. And, um, you know, a, a credit card, you, you owe 50 bucks on a credit card, it's easy to pay it back. You put $5,000 on that credit card, it's pretty hard to pay it back. Now, the state continues building on this credit card. I don't know the exact number, $6,000 per person. Um, not every person in Alaska is entitled to that because they weren't here for the full time and many have already left sadly. Um, it's not actually gonna be four point something billion or probably something over three billion. And, and like I said, every year for the last five or six years, the state of Alaska has gone to the CBR and spent $3 billion every year for the last five years. What do we have to show for it? Um, if we were ever going to use any of those funds, I think we should entrust Alaskans to spend that money more than the, the legislators in Anchorage, I mean, in Juneau, pardon me. Gotcha, so then we'll go back quickly to uh, Mr. Johnson and ask, I mean, do you do you think that, that potential investors are gonna be, uh, potential oil investors are gonna be, you know, feeling confident to hear from legislative candidates that there is not any kind of real plan to deal with this problem? I mean, I mean is this something that um, you think the legislature needs to take on pretty quickly when they get back to Juneau? We've got like 15 seconds here, I'm sorry for that. Okay, well, first I'm gonna disagree that oil pays the bills anymore. That may have been the case when we had $120 a barrel, but it's not. Uh, investors wouldn't be affected because this is a past tax credit to previous operations. It wouldn't apply to new exploration and new development. So it wouldn't impair the ability of new operators to come into Alaska. The one thing that affects that is the price of oil not tax structures or tax credits. Okay, well, um, thank you, Mr. Johnson. So uh, now we'll move on to the fun part, uh, the lightning round, where we'll ask each candidate a series of yes or no questions. Um, I'll repeat myself here just for posterity. These are yes or no questions, not yes or maybe or a little bit questions. So really looking for a yes or a no. Um, so we'll start with uh, Mr. Holland. Uh, Mr. Holland, will you get the COVID-19 vaccine when it's released, yes or no? Yes. Uh, Mr. Johnson, will you get the COVID-19 vaccine when it's released? Yes or no? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Johnson, did you go dip netting this year? And if so, uh, which river and how many fish did you catch? We'll, we'll give you a little yes, no leeway here. Uh, no, and unfortunately, because I was doing this. Gotcha, okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Holland, uh, what was your uh, dip netting uh, record this year? Uh, also, no, because I was doing this, but we typically hit the South Kenai Beach. T tough times as legislative candidates. Okay, uh, thank you. Mr. Holland, are you a yes or a no on Ballot Measure 1, the oil tax initiative? I am a no on Ballot Measure 1. Thank you. Mr. Johnson, yes or no on Ballot Measure 1? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Johnson, are you yes or no on Ballot Measure 2, the elections overhaul? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Holland, yes or no on ballot measure two? I am a no on ballot measure two. Thank you. Mr. Holland, um, have you been to see the Portage Glacier, which is in this Senate district? <laughs> yes, I have. Thank I you. rode the uh, Armageddon. Thank you. Mr. Johnson, have you been to Portage Glacier? Yes, many times. Thank you. Mr. Johnson, have you purchased marijuana from a pot shop in Alaska? No. Thank you. Mr. Holland, have you purchased marijuana from a pot shop in Alaska? I will elaborate. I'm still a member of the United States Coast Guard Reserve. We're not even allowed to walk into a pot shop, so the answer is no. It's legal. I've been to a pot shop. I'll just put it out there. Um, <laughs> thank you. Mr. Holland, um, have you ever been to the Totem Movie Theater, which is in this Senate district? Yes, I have. Three dollar movies. Great. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Have you been to the Totem Movie Theater? Yes, I have. 
Okay, thank you, Mr. Johnson. Do you think Governor Mike Dunleavy has done a good job handling the COVID-19 pandemic? No. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Holland. Do you think Governor Mike Dunleavy has done a good job handling the COVID-19 pandemic? I would have to say yes, uh, considering all things, it's a complicated issue. Okay. Well, that'll, uh, I think that'll wrap it up for the uh, lightning round. Um, that was enlightening. Mr. Holland and Mr. Johnson, I want to thank you both for being with us tonight. Both of those candidates will be on the ballot for Senate District N, which includes parts of South and East Anchorage, as well as Indian, Kirdwood, and Portage. We're going to take a quick break here while we get ready for the next debate on our schedule, which is for an Anchorage Hillside House seat. We'll be back soon. Thanks for sticking with us. Thanks for sticking with us. This is running a legislative debate program produced by Alaska Public Media and KTOO. I'm Nat Herz. For our next debate tonight, we're headed to the Anchorage Hillside to the House District currently represented by Republican Mel Gillis, who was appointed to his seat last year by Governor Mike Dunleavy. Gillis arrived in Alaska more than 50 years ago and has worked on Cook Inlet oil platforms and on the North Slope. 
He's also been a professional hunting guide. His opponent is Calvin Schrage, an independent who's running with the Alaska Democratic Party's nomination. Schrage grew up in Anchorage and has an accounting degree from the University of Alaska Anchorage. He runs a tutoring business and belongs to the Anchorage Chamber of Commerce and the Abbott Loop Community Council. We'll start with Mr. Schrage's opening statement. Mr. Schrage, your opening statement, one minute. Yeah, hi everyone. It's so great to be here. Thank you all for tuning in. My name is Calvin Shragi and I'm running for state house here in District 25 on Anchorage's Lower Hillside. And the reason I'm running is because I truly care about this community and we've got to get through these uncertain times. This is where I grew up. I learned to walk, talk, and ride my bike just outside the house here. I went to our local public schools, formed lasting relationships with my neighbors here in the district, and I plan to start a family here uh, of my own right here in, in District 25. And we've got to make sure that we have strong public schools, universities, robust public safety, and mental health care and substance abuse treatment to prevent crime in the first place. We've got critical needs here in our community that we have to stand up for. So we've got to fix the budget, but we've got to do so in a responsible way. That's why I'm running and I'm looking forward to the conversation tonight. Thank you, Mr. Shragi. Uh, Representative Gillis, your opening statement, one minute, please. Yes, I'm Mel Gillis. I'm a Republican running in the District 25. My wife, Ann, and I have lived in this district for 32 years. I'm proud to say that we will, will be celebrating the 50th wedding anniversary in four days. My son and grandkids all went to service high school. I came to Alaska in 1965 looking for work and adventure, and I found both. I have worked construction all over the state, work in the oil fields in Cook Inlet and on the North Slope. 1970, I got my marriage license and hunting guide license. Proud to say, they're still going strong. At my age, I'm not looking for a career in politics. After 50 years of owning and running a business, I have seen both good and bad times. I wanna take my lifetime of experience to Juno to ensure my grandkids and future generations of Alaskans have the same opportunities that I have had. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Gillis. So we'll go to our first question for Mr. Shragi. Mr. Shragi, the governor vetoed more than a hundred million dollars that the legislature set aside to repay Alaska school districts for school construction. It's a program known as school bond debt reimbursement. The veto cost the average Anchorage homeowner about $170 in extra property taxes. Do you support that decision and why? Well, you know, I, I think it, I, I don't support it, first off. Let me just answer that clearly. We, we've got to find real ways to balance this budget and sh simply shifting costs onto municipalities and, and other communities. That That's not how we get through this. We need to get through this by, yes, finding cuts and finding efficiencies where we can uh, to reduce our budget where it makes sense and, and where uh, we can do so responsibly. But th that's not the issue we're facing today. We are facing an issue of making sure that we have the services we depend on. We need to make sure that we have funding for these programs and that uh, we find a way to balance this budget that isn't directly uh, pulling on Alaskans here in Anchorage or in our communities. Uh, this is just a cost shift and it's a cost that we're paying. Thank you, Mr. Shragi. Uh, Representative Gillis, the governor's veto of school construction money caused the average Anchorage homeowner to pay about $170 in extra property taxes. Do you support that decision? Yes. Uh, why? Why? We don't. Alaska's broke. We really don't have the money that we need. Okay. Um, well, I guess, uh, I mean, I, I'd, I'd circle back there. I mean, uh, is, uh, is, I don't know if that's a pretty straightforward answer, so maybe I won't circle back there. Um, we'll just move on to, to question two. Um, this is for Representative Gillis. Representative Gillis, Alaska's per student schools budget, uh, what's known as the BSA or base student allocation has not increased since 2017. Do you support an increase in school spending to keep up with inflation? No, you know, some of the highest spending in the country, Alaska has, and we're getting some of the worst results. We need to get value for our spending. I support public schools. Uh, my son and grandkids have went to school up here. 
Okay, so um, I, thank you, Representative Gillis. Uh, Mr. Shragi, your question, Alaska's per student schools budget, what's known as the BSA, has not increased since 2017. Do you support an increase in school spending to keep up with inflation? So I, I think that we do have to address education funding. That That is for sure. We're watch, watching school districts uh, deal with, yeah, the cost of inflation, the cost of increased uh, medical care and, and health care costs. So, you know, every every year that we go with flat budgets for our schools uh, is yet another tick away at their ability to serve our students and educate our next generation. So that, that's something we have to address. I think the other thing is we, we have to provide them with stable funding that they can plan and prepare for. You know, this last minute funding of education that we see year after year in the legislature, it's not working. Pink slipping our teachers, that's just yet another cost increase for our state. So we, we need real solutions. We need to address these costs and, and these problems that we have uh, if we're going to get through this crisis. So is that, so Mr. Shragi, is that a, is that a yes? Uh, you would support an increase to the BSA for inflation? Well, I know that there are going to be a lot of pieces in play this next year in the legislature. The budget is very complicated. And as Gil has stated, uh, things are very tight. We're going to have to uh, have very serious conversations and very tough conversations about where exactly that funding is going to go. At the very least, we have to keep funding flat. We cannot make further cuts to education. If we can afford it, if we can find the revenues and we can find a way to increase funding for our schools, I would support that. We need to invest in education. It's the best place we can put our money today. So we'll circle back to Representative Gillis. Um, Representative Gillis, I mean, you, you referenced getting better value for our spending. Um, what specifically d can the legislature do to accomplish that? I mean, that's, that's sort of the kind of thing we hear from legislators, but without any specific solutions to get us more efficient. Uh, local control. How does that save us money? Well, number one, we need to downsize the government what we can't afford. Is there a number two or that was just number one? Nope, that's it. <laughs> gotcha. So, I mean, would you would you support cutting, uh, you know, public schools funding at this point? No, let's keep it where it's at. Gotcha, okay, thank you. So moving on to question number three, we'll start with Mr. Shragi. Um, Alaska faces a deficit next year of around a billion dollars under the status quo and more than $2 billion if we pay a permanent fund dividend under the traditional formula. Do you support an income tax to help cover that gap and why or why not? One minute. So we, as I stated before, we have to address the revenue side of the equation. I think folks that say the way that we balance the budget is through cuts. We've seen that attempted. We've watched massive cuts take place over these last few years, and we've seen the pain and devastation that those cuts cause. So, you know, again, we're in tough fiscal times. We need to find cuts where we can, but, but that's not the solution. That's not how we're going to get through this. We need to address revenues. I think that does involve looking at an income tax, a sales tax, you know, any sort of revenue generating measure that we can find and find some agreement on, we've got to move forward. I do think that an income tax is quite equitable and it has the added benefit of taxing those out-of-state workers that come up, work on our in our fisheries, work on the North Slope, uh, cost us money through infrastructure and travel, and then take that money home to spend in their own communities. So I, I do think that there would be some benefits to, uh, to, to that measure. But again, uh, one way or another, we've got to balance the budget and we need to make sure that it's equitable, fair, and that it minimizes the impact on Alaskans. Thank you, uh, Mr. Shaggy. Representative Gillis, do you support an income tax to help cover Alaska's budget deficit? No. All right. That should be the last option. Okay. Um, so, well, so I'll just go straight back to you. Um, uh, how, how else should we be uh, covering the deficit if not with an income tax? We could first get a spending cap. Number two, we've got to balance the budget. And the taxes should be the last resort, not the first option. So are you saying that you support uh, cuts to government in that case? And if so, can you name some specific programs that you would support cuts to? Well, you got the Constitution, which says what we have to uh, pay for. Then you've got what we need. And then you got what we want. We need to take care of the constitutional spending and what we need before we go to what we want. So 
is that a no, you don't have any specific programs that you would support cuts to? Probably not. Uh, I would just have to uh, do a lot more checking on programs. Okay. Uh, Mr. Shragi, we'll go back to you quickly. I mean, you, you did not commit to supporting any particular kind of attacks. If there was uh, majority support, including your vote in the legislature for an income tax, would you vote for it conceptually? Oh, certainly. If there's a consensus in the legislature for an income tax, uh, hey, and it funds schools and public safety and infrastructure and the roads being plowed. I mean, those are the things that we want. And, you know, I know that talking with my neighbors here in the district, um, you know, I've knocked on more than 3,000 doors and my neighbors understand that we have to pay for these services. We cannot go without public schools or universities or plowing in the winters. Okay. People are willing to chip in for strong services. Thank you, Mr. Shragi. So last question will go to Representative Gillis first. Uh, Representative Gillis, Governor Dunleavy disbanded the state commission that was planning Alaska's response to global warming. Um, we've seen climate change uh, force the relocation of rural villages, and we've also seen it add tens of millions of dollars to the cost of our resource development projects. I just reported a story on how the Red Dog Mine had to spend $20 million on a new water treatment system because of permafrost thaw. Um, what actions should the state be taking to address the effects of global warming here? Well, be on the hunting guide and know that it's occurring. That's gonna be up to the, in Alaska. So I would just have to say, we're gonna have to let the government figure that one out. Uh, there's not enough people up there to really be damaging uh, Alaska. So as far as climate change, I believe it's real and uh, something should be done about it. So you've got 30 seconds left in your answer here. I'll just come right back to you. Do you I mean, when you say the government should figure that out, that's not you as a member of the legislature? Uh, that would be the federal government's job. Okay. Um, thank you. So, Representative, thank you, Representative Gillis. So, Mr. Shragi, what actions should the state be taking to address the effects of climate change here? Well, I agree with Gillis. Uh, climate change is real, and it is something that has to be addressed. I think that's exactly what the Climate Action Plan did. It incorporated climate action into our uh, governmental planning. I, I think that we should bring back that climate action plan, and we, start, we should plan for the very real uh, uh, repercussions of climate change that we're seeing. We need to plan ahead. When we relocate villages or address these problems as they occur, it costs us more money at a time when we don't have the means to take care of those issues. So we need to plan ahead, reduce costs, uh, set, set folks up here in Alaska for success, and, and give them the time and planning to be able to adapt to this changing world that we're in. So we've still got 20 seconds left here. I mean, yeah. would, you, would you vote for legislation reestablishing a, a climate change task force or a climate change policy for Alaska? I think that I think that we have to. Like I said, if, if we don't uh, plan for these these issues that we're seeing, uh, we don't plan ahead. It costs us more money. That, that's the opposite direction we need to be headed in. So, yes, I would vote to reinstate that. Um, it, it's an issue that has to be addressed. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Shragi. So we'll uh, jump forward to the lightning round um, where we'll ask each candidate a series of yes or no questions. Um, I'll repeat myself here. We're looking for yes or no, uh, not any other form of answer here. So we'll start with uh, Mr. Shragi. Mr. Shragi, does the permanent fund dividend belong in the Alaska Constitution in some form? Yes or no? Was that the permanent fund dividend? Correct. Uh, I believe that we should. Y yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Representative Gillis, does the permanent fund dividend belong in the Alaska Constitution in some form? Yes or no? Yes. Thank you, Representative Gillis. Um, Representative Gillis, are you voting for ballot measure one, the oil tax initiative? No. Uh, Mr. Shragi, are you voting for ballot measure one, the oil tax initiative? No. Uh, Mr. Shragi, are you voting for ballot measure two, the election overhaul? Uh, not in favor of the ranked choice necessarily. We're, we're looking uh, for like a the yes money no. stuff. Yeah, no. Okay, uh, Representative Gillis, uh, <laughs> yes or no on ballot measure two, the election overhaul? No. Thank you. Representative Gillis, can the Pebble Project and the Bristol Bay salmon fishery safely coexist? Yes or no? Boy, that's a hard one. Uh, I'm, yes. I'm going to have to say no. 
Okay, Mr. Shragi, uh, can the Pebble Project and Bristol Bay Salmon Fishery coexist, yes or no? No. Thank you, Mr. Shragi. Have you ever eaten one of the delicious burgers at the Long Branch Saloon, which is located in uh, this house district? Uh, almost better than the burgers are the cheese curds, yes. <laughs> uh, thank you. Representative Gillis, have you ever had a burger at the Long Branch Saloon? Last night. <laughs> That's a better than yes or no. Thank you. Representative Gillis, have you ever seen a bear in Far North Bicentennial Park, which is also in your district? No, I haven't. Uh, Mr. Shragi, have you seen a bear in Far North Bicentennial Park, yes or no? Just on the edge up at service. Thank you, Mr. Shragi. Does the state get a fair amount of tax and royalty revenue from the mining industry, yes or no? I'll say no. Thank you, Representative Gillis. Does the state get a fair amount of tax and royalty revenue from the mining industry, yes or no? No. Thank you. Um, I think we'll wrap up the lightning round there. Um, and uh, yeah, we're just skipping forward here. Um, that's uh, Calvin Shragi, the uh, independent candidate running with the Democratic nomination uh, for a Hillside House uh, seat, uh, along with the incumbent Republican representative, Mel Gillis. We're gonna take a quick break here while we get ready for the next debate on our schedule, which is for a tight race for an East Anchorage State House seat. We'll be back soon. Thanks for sticking with us and thank you for being with us, Mr. Shragi and Representative Gillis.
Thanks. Thanks for sticking with us. This is Running, a legislative debate program produced by Alaska Public Media and KTOO. I'm Nat Hers. Our next debate tonight is for the East Anchorage House seat currently held by Republican Lance Pruitt. Pruitt respectfully declined to appear on tonight's program, so we're here just with his Democratic opponent, Liz Snyder. I don't know if we can really call this a debate anymore, but it's, uh, it'll be something. This is uh, Snyder's second time running for this House seat. She's a professor of public health at University of Alaska Anchorage and a soil and water scientist with a doctorate from the University of Florida, where she was also on the gymnastics team. Ms. Snyder, <laughs> you have a minute for your opening statement. <clears throat> Ah, you took all my intro material, Nat. Thank you. Um, yes, Liz Snyder running for State House over here in East Anchorage's District 27. Uh, been a long time East Sider, raising uh, Sam and I, my husband, raising our two young boys over here. And as you said, Nat, I am a public health professional with a background in soil and water science as well as public health. Um, have been working for the past 11 years at the university, but have also had the opportunity to work not only in the public sector, but also in the private sector before coming up here to Alaska. Um, and it's given me the opportunity to work all across Alaska in urban and rural communities working on public health challenges. Um, and the last thing I'll say is I'm excited to be running and what's driving me to run is we've had a lot of division in the legislature over the past several years, but we've got a lot of challenges coming up and persistent challenges and then put that into the broader context of this pandemic. And we're going to need some people willing to show up and willing to work hard and work together to address these challenges. Thank you, Ms. Snyder. Um, so we'll go to your first question. Um, this year's permanent fund dividend was $992. Uh, was that the right amount and why or why not? One minute. Yeah, um, it's uh, the permanent fund dividend is a big one on everyone's mind. And for me, as a legislator, I am going to be a proponent for the full dividend according to the, the original formula. And that's what I'd like to have seen. That's what I would like to see going forward to the best of our abilities, particularly now as we have families struggling in this pandemic. Uh, gotcha. OK, um, so uh, how do we pay for that? Yeah, the big question, and I know it's one we've been asking all of our uh, candidates here, as we should be. It's, it's an important one. We all need to be able to answer it. So as the legislator, I will be advocating, like I said, for the full PFD, but also being very clear uh, with Alaskans and having conversations with East Anchorage folks about what that actually means. Uh, we know that if we do the full PFD, we're also looking at uh, one and a half to two billion plus deficit and we need to be thoughtful about how we're going to deal with that uh, maybe part of the answer is actually in the hands of the voters uh, and looking at our oil tax structure if we are indeed an oil state are we getting our fair share of that and that would help us fill in some of that of course additional cuts can be made and should be made finding more efficiencies but also acknowledging and being honest with ourselves that we have made hundreds of millions of dollars of cuts over the past several years Okay, thank you, Ms. Snyder. So uh, for your second question, um, Alaska uh, will have a, at least a $1 billion deficit this coming year if we stick with a status quo budget. Um, as you said, if we uh, go to a statutory PFD, that takes us at least to $2 billion at minimum, I think. So uh, would you support uh, a broad-based tax to close that gap? And if so, what kind? Sure. Um as I mentioned a moment ago, I would first like Alaskans to weigh in on our oil tax structure and are we satisfied with what we're working with now and what we've had for the past several years after the passage of SB 21. Um, if we do address that, if we fix that, uh, that fills a very large portion of that budget gap that you're talking about. Uh, so my understanding is I think the proponents of that oil tax legislation say that it would raise around a billion dollars if we pay a full PFD uh, that is still, we're in the $2 billion deficit range. So maybe we lose a, yeah. a billion dollars from that, but we, the end of this year, we only have $500 million in our savings account. So I don't even think that's the solution right. for one year. Um, so, I mean, right. would we not need some other form of revenue like in the form of a broad-based tax? I'm really not willing to talk about any other forms of taxes until we address that first one that, I'm, that I've addressed. 
Um, we do have some savings left. I'm not a big fan of dipping into that, but our legislature has turned to that for the past several years, uh, draining what we have 16 billion um, from our CBR, and now we're, we're down to next to near nothing. Um, but what I said before, that's the first thing that I wanna look at. It's, I do not wanna talk about shifting some of these other expenses onto Alaskans until that conversation is had. So are you comfortable then uh, dipping into the earnings reserve to fill a deficit if we do not get a increase in oil tax, uh, in oil taxes, um, dipping into the earnings reserve beyond the sustainable 5% POMV set by the legislature? Not indefinitely, no. That's not something that I wanna do indefinitely. And even my opponent will agree with me. If you look at his statements in the media, we're pretty much on the same page that we do want to, until we have addressed the formula, that we are obligated to do the full PFD, but we do need to have that conversation. Uh, if you're looking for a distinction between my opponent and I on that front, you're not gonna find it here. So, but would you support going beyond that sustainable POMV amount for a year or two, for example, until we have these broader issues sorted out that you're talking about? Yes, that's what I'm saying. Okay, gotcha. Uh, thank you. So for our third question, um, Medicaid and public schools are two of the single biggest line items in Alaska's budget. Together they add up to about $2 billion in uh, unrestricted general fund spending. Do you see any opportunities for savings or efficiencies in either of those programs, which is a uh, euphemism, I guess, that I wrote for cuts? Uh, and if so, uh, what would those be? Sure. Uh, so to be clear, you're asking me about uh, changes we might make to education and to uh, Medicaid. I, yeah, I'm asking if you, if you, if there are cuts to either of those programs, public schools or the Medicaid program, that you would support. Right. Um, I'm not looking at cuts in terms of what would directly impact. Let's start with education. One of our biggest drivers in the cost of education is healthcare. Um, and that is not something that we have adequately addressed. We do not have competitive rates for our staff and for our teachers. And if we can drive down the cost of healthcare, that would be my number one priority in reducing the cost of education. With respect to Medicare, I would like us to start thinking about Medi a different model. Medicaid, it right. Um, excuse me, thank you, Medicaid, looking at a different model. Um, right now, we have a fee-for-service model whereby we are um, reimbursing our providers based on how many services a patient receives, how many um, exams, how many procedures. It's not based on the outcome, the health outcome that we want to see for the patient. I would really like us to, to shift that to value-based care, where it's a holistic approach. We, we are reimbursing based on the, the health outcome. And what that does is that encourages our providers to look at the whole individual and thinking about, for example, if we have an individual um, struggling with a weight issue and it's exacerbating uh, heart disease, diabetes, increasing risk for cancer, what, what can we do outside of the doctor's office to help address those issues? Um, so that can also drive down care by improving health outcomes much quicker and cutting back on so many um, of the procedures that are driving up the cost of health care. That, that does sound like a longer term kind of reform. Is that fair to say? It, it can be. Um, I think you're going to see improved or increased savings over time, but it's something that can be, uh, it doesn't have to take forever to get started. Okay. Um, so I guess we'll, uh, actually just skip ahead to the lightning round here uh, where we'll ask you a series of yes or no questions and I will just emphasize these are yes or no questions, um, not uh, any other words are desired in this uh, section of the program. So uh, Ms. Snyder, should Alaska have a red flag law that would allow for temporary seizure of a person's guns if they present a danger to themselves or others, yes or no? Yes. Thank you. Uh, so next question, should the state offer tax credits or subsidies to encourage the development of renewable energy in Alaska, yes or no? Yes. Thank you. Um, Ms. Snyder, have you ever shot a moose or a caribou, yes or no? No, but I have bartered um, in the ways that it is allowed yes, to be done. Yes, we're, we're sticking to yes or no. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, have you ever been to the Anchorage Baptist Temple, which is uh, in your house district, yes or no? 
Yes, I have, back in 2018. Thank you. Um, have you ever been to the Krispy Kreme shop that's in your district, yes or no? Yes. Thank you. Um, how are you voting on ballot measure one, the oil tax initiative? Uh, you can probably guess I'm a yes. Thank you. Uh, how are you voting on ballot measure two, the elections overhaul, yes or no? I am also a yes. Thank you. Um, should Alaska elected officials have term limits, yes or no? Yes. Thank you. Um, should the legislature increase the per student public schools budget, yes or no? I don't like this game, Nat, because I feel some answers are not yes or no. It's got to um, be yes or no. I'm going to say no, but there's caveats that you know I want to talk about. Ca caveats, no with caveats, OK. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you for your lightning round participation. Ms. Snyder, thanks for being here with us tonight. She's on the ballot for House District 27, which includes part of Muldoon and Stuck Again Heights, and it's represented by Republican uh, Lance Pruitt. Uh, we'll have one more break here before we come back for the last debate on our schedule for a Kenai Peninsula House seat. Stay with us. Thanks for staying with us. This is Running, a legislative debate program produced by Alaska Public Media and KTOO. 
I'm Nat Hers. For our next debate tonight, we're headed to the Kenai. House District 31 covers the southern part of the peninsula, including Homer, An Anchor Point, Ninilchik, and Kasilov. The seat is currently held by Representative Sarah Vance, a Republican from Homer. Uh, Vance was first elected to the seat two years ago after defeating a long-serving incumbent, Paul Seaton. She has a degree in small business and accounting and has traveled around the world doing mission work. She's also worked in the fishing and tourism industries. Um, Ms. Cooper is also from Homer and is running as an independent. She's been the president of the Kenai Peninsula Borough Assembly and also on the boards of the Homer Chamber of Commerce and the local hospital operating board. She's worked as a realtor, a bartender, an insurance agent, and now has a coffee stand out East End Road. We'll start with opening statements one minute each. Uh, Representative Vance, your opening statement one minute, please. <clears throat> Good evening, it's so good to be here. And I'm Representative Sarah Vance. I'm running for re-election for State House. I have uh, fulfilled what people elected me to do by repealing SB 91, rejecting a state income tax, and re voting to restore the permanent fund dividend. Obviously, we still have more work to do on that, but I am continuing to keep my word to my constituents and I'm working on other larger issues as well like human trafficking. I've been working on ab removing abandoned vehicles all across the district uh, because uh, we have removed more than 100 so far and uh, working to enact a stronger constitutional spending cap. There's more work for us to be done, but it's been a pleasure serving you and I look forward to uh, representing you again in Juneau. Thank you, Representative Vance. Now we'll go to Ms. Cooper for your opening statement. One minute, please. Good evening, thanks for having me. I'm Kelly Cooper and I am running for State House. I'm a small business owner and I've served two terms on the Kenai Peninsula Borough Assembly, twice as president. I've always been invested in our community, serving wherever I see a need, such as the hospital operating board, as you mentioned, and the Homer Chamber of Commerce Board. But coaching basketball at the Boys and Girls Club was a really great way to become involved with our youth. Alaska works better when we work together and we certainly deserve better. I believe that working with one another, we can solve the challenges facing Alaska. We all want the same things, good jobs, strong schools, and safe communities. Instead of looking at differences, I believe we can work together to build an economically vibrant Alaska. I'm running because I know what it takes to balance a budget. My experience on the borough assembly has taught me to work with all sides of an issue. I can and will deliver practical solutions to the challenges Alaska is facing. Thank you, Ms. Cooper. Uh, so now we'll move to some questions. We'll start with Ms. Cooper for the first question. Um, Ms. Cooper, childcare has been a huge problem for working families during the COVID-19 pandemic. What should the legislature do to ease that challenge for Alaskans? One minute. That's a tough one. Um, owning a uh, espresso stand as well as the uh, uh, rental cabins that I have, I do have employees that have child care issues and occasionally they're at work with them, which uh, we really try to accommodate them. So the legislature needs to try to utilize some of our CARES funds to uh, promote uh, the opportunity for child care. I think that's a big part of our economy and uh, maximizing those dollars would help in going forward with that. Thank you, Ms. Cooper. Representative Vance, uh, what should the state do to ease the challenge of child care during the COVID-19 pandemic? One minute. Well, one of the first things that we could do was help provide the stability in our education system. A lot of parents are uh, put into a bind when the schools are choosing uh, not to open during the pandemic for a variety of reasons and are left with uh, not knowing if they will be able to go to work and where their children are gonna be taken care of. So we need to help uh, offer after school programs and um, be able to give them the assurance that school will be open or will be closed. And um, just providing a stable format on that will help ease the childcare burden right now, but also empowering small businesses and helping them get started to be able to open up homes for daycare options is another alternative to help people uh, right where they're at and also many of our seniors that um, are not in the vulnerable population, but um, will be able to help with 
some of the smaller children and um, help in their own neighborhoods as well. So we'll go back to you, uh, Representative Vance. I mean, is when you were talking about sort of having assurances or more certainty about uh, schools being open or closed, is there a place for the legislature there? Would you could you see the legislature, you know, passing some kind of directive or mandate that schools be open or closed? No, I think it's more of an encouragement that uh, the the school districts giving them the stability and the encouragement that uh, we are doing great as far as the numbers on the pandemic. I don't believe that government has to mandate uh, solutions for the people all the time, but we need to provide an opportunity to help uh, strengthen the economy, give people opportunities and make it easier for them to be able to provide for themselves. Um, we'll go back to Ms. Cooper, and then I think I'll actually ask the same quick question of Representative Vance. Um, if, uh, you know, if we don't see another round of CARES Act aid, would you support general fund spending uh, to support child, you know, child care, some kind of child care benefit for Alaskans? I would support that. We would certainly have to look at the budget and, and find a place that we could pull that from because, as you know, our deficit is critical. Um, but certainly when our kids can be at daycare or at school, it allows our parents back to work. And that's exactly what we need to get our economy moving again. Our parents need to be able to get to work. So Representative Vance, I'll, I'll send that question back to you as well. If, if more CARES Act funding did not uh, emerge or another federal aid package, would you support uh, some amount of additional general fund spending to support child care? We've got about 15 seconds here. Uh, I don't believe there is any additional funding available, but if we re reprioritize, I think we should have that conversation on what we can do as a priority because it does empower Alaskans to be able to go to work. Thank you. Okay, so to our second question, we'll start with Representative Vance. Um, Representative Vance, do you support further cuts to the state budget? And if so, um, what are three specific line items that you would cut and how much would you cut each one of them? Uh, thank you for the question. This one obviously is very direct. I haven't thought about specific line items that uh, that I would cut, but just adjusting our formulas and having the conversation about what we consider as a priority, we can no longer continue to spend at the level that we are. So yes, I am for what more budget cuts because Alaskans have said that we need to tighten the belt and and make the adjustments because they don't want an income tax they don't want their pfd to be cut anymore and uh to be able to be in the economy in their hands so uh one area that i do support cutting that the legislature has consistently opposed is abortion funding i believe that that should be eliminated uh, there are um, other adjustments that we need to to be uh, taking a look at, but I have not had an agenda to target uh, specific things. We need to look at a lot of uh, the the other uh, non-essential items well, and focus on everything that Alaskans have made clear are a priority like critical infrastructure. Okay, thank you, Representative Vance. Ms. Cooper, uh, second question to you. Do you support further cuts to the state budget? If so, um, can you name three specific line items that you would cut and say by how much? Uh, one minute. Well, thanks for that, and that is a tough question. Um, I absolutely approve downward pressure on the budget. When we look at three line items, um, the way I look at a budget is to determine where I can get the most value. So. For me, it's about making sure that when we look at our budget, we look at maximizing our boots on the ground and keeping those people um, working, and those are jobs for our economy, and look at these top uh, positions and these additional commissioners and these sole source contracts, um, as well as being really careful uh, with our attorney generals that we don't end up with a lot more litigation because that becomes very expensive. Okay, um, so we'll go right back to Representative Vance. Um, I think the I think it's the legislature has been rebuffed in trying to cut abortion funding, uh, which I also think is a rounding error in the grand scheme of the budget. So I, I you know, I'm going to come back to both of you guys. Um, 
If you're saying we still need to cut the budget and that that's what Alaskans want and you're running for office, I mean, you have no, you have no specific programs uh, beyond abortion funding that you could identify specifically where you would support budget reductions? Is this question for me? Yeah, sorry, Representative Ann. I apologize for that. Thank you for clarifying. No, I think that we need to uh, look at uh, reductions in the university system. Uh, the legislature has been asking the university to make consolidations and adjust the way they're doing things for at least a decade. Now, I want the university system to succeed, and I voted to increase uh, spending for our uh, community campuses and also for uh, things like the AvTech programs and lower the spending on the larger areas of the budget that um, are no longer producing as efficiently. Those are the things that we need to, to do in, in consolidation so that the university can perform at a higher level. It can no longer be all things to all people. Is there a specific number you think uh, is a reasonable number to propose for further reductions to the university? Uh, no, I would like to see uh, what their proposal was on consolidation. It seems like they don't continue to have a serious conversation about it. They say that they're going to look at it, but then uh, numbers haven't been presented to legislature on okay. what that would actually look like. So then we'll go quickly back to Ms. Cooper. We've got about 20 seconds here. Um, I also didn't, I mean, sole source contracts and commissioners are also, I think, rounding area, errors in the you know grand scope of the budget. So are there any specific programs uh, and specific amounts by which you would support cuts to those programs that you could identify? Um, there isn't one particular program that I would support cutting completely. Um, I do believe that we have to evaluate each and every program. And when I talk about um, commissioners, that's an example. But we have to make sure that we're getting the most value. So I always look at cutting at the top and making sure that we're getting those jobs continuing in our economy and having those boots on the ground. So for example, um, fish and game funding. Let's make sure that the fish and game funding is funded for the folks that are on the ground through science so we can maximize our resources, which also helps our revenue. Okay, thank you, Ms. Cooper. So now we'll uh, move to our third question. We'll start with Ms. Cooper. Um, Ms. Cooper, as of last year, there were about 100 villages, uh, many with predominantly Alaska Native populations, that lacked law enforcement of any kind. Um, that's according to the Anchorage Daily News' Lawless Project reporting. Do you support a boost to the Alaska State Troopers budget to provide more coverage in rural Alaska? One minute, Ms. Cooper. Well, I absolutely do support a boost to our state troopers budget, but it's our entire uh, criminal justice budget, budget that we have to look at. You know, we have to look at, uh, when we talk about the uh, crime bill, uh, we have to look at more prosecutors, public defenders, um, more uh, law enforcement. So I do support that. And when we talk about the villages that aren't having um, that support, you know, we're a big state, but we all end up being together. So uh, those folks that are struggling in the uh, villages, they end up in Anchorage, they end up in other communities, and we really need to address um, substance misuse as well because that's part of our crime issue. So it's a much bigger problem that affects different areas of our budget, and we just can't keep siloing those. We've got to be able to look at that as one big picture. Thank you, Ms. Cooper. Representative Vance, do you support a boost to the Alaska State Troopers budget to provide more coverage in rural Alaska? One minute. I think this is a, a, a two-part question. Thank you for that. We did provide for 15 additional troopers in this last budget, and we are working on fulfilling those. The good news is, is that uh, the public safety has changed the way they are recruiting, and it's working. We've had more people graduating from our public safety academy uh, to provide more coverage. However, we still are hard pressed to have a trooper in every village because we have so many villages and um, there is a law enforcement shortage. But the village pa public safety officer program is a little bit different than the state troopers. It works in partnership with it and that is a bill that I worked on to try to um, provide them uh, an easier way to recruit locals and be able to, to work with the state troopers. There's still a lot of work to be done on that. It's not just a matter of funding, but providing the 
clear statutes that allows for those grants to work in partnership with the tribes and the communities there. And I think that there's still a lot of good work to be done. And uh, that is an issue that I care uh, very deeply about. Gotcha. Okay. I think we'll skip rebuttal on that one and move on to uh, our last question. Uh, we'll start with Representative Vance. Um, Representative Vance, the governor appointed an employee of the Pebble Partnership, that's the company that's seeking to build the Pebble Mine in Bristol Bay, uh, to the Board of Fisheries. His name is Abe Williams. He's Pebble's Director of Regional Affairs. Um, do you think Mr. Williams should be confirmed? Uh, one minute, Representative Vance. <clears throat> Thank you for that. I've had the uh, pleasure of interviewing Abe Williams myself, and he's come with high recommendations on, on his insight into the fishery. I do find it unfortunate that um, his interaction, his name of being associated with Pebble has been a detriment to him. And uh, I've heard from my district that they feel that because of his ties to Pebble, that that would interfere with his ability to govern well for the and make decisions on the Board of Fisheries. However, it should never come uh, as um, a point of interest in the committee. I've not made a full decision on that, but I will follow. I am taking um, more insight from people in my district and the fishermen on that issue. We're still receiving emails, so I have not made a full decision at this time. Got it. Thank you, Representative Vance. Um, Ms. Cooper, should Abe Williams, the Regional Affairs Director for the Pebble Partnership, be confirmed to the Board of Fisheries? One minute, Ms. Cooper. He absolutely should not be. He should have. He should not have been brought forth as a uh, consideration. Um, the uh, Bristol Bay area is critical to our fish and uh, the Board of Fish is uh, uh, not as balanced as I would like to see it. Uh, we, we don't have the coastal representation. A lot of them are interior. And these appointments to the Board of Fish should not be political. Um, they should be based on someone's ability to do the work and their experience and their representation. And the coastal communities are sorely underrepresented. And I absolutely do not support him being appointed to the Board of Fish. All right. Uh, those are both pretty clear answers. Um, uh, I, I guess I'll, I'll come back to uh, each of each of uh, each of you and ask Ms. Cooper. Um, do you think that the Pebble project can be built safely and should be permitted? Absolutely not. Um, I did not support the uh, Pebble mine um, before the Pebble tapes came out, and uh, I certainly do not uh, support it now. Our, when we talk about our resources and uh, maximizing the value of our resources, I consider our renewable resources just as important. And our fish are extremely important to the state. So I, in no way, shape, or form do I support the Pebble Mine. I think uh, resources should be developed as long as we can develop them responsibly, but certainly not there. Thanks, Ms. Cooper. Uh, Representative Vance, do you think the uh Pebble project should be, uh, be permitted and uh, can it be safely built? Uh, whether or not it can be safely built is not my decision. That's up to the uh, currently in the federal um, permitting process and they have come to the conclusion that at this time it cannot. And so I have uh, no other position but to agree with that process. I've been basing my uh, views about Pebble on that process that as long as they can work through that and show the people that they can uh, fulfill the obligations to the permitting process and do it responsibly uh, according to our strict environmental standards that they should be given that opportunity. However, they have failed to do so and um, you know they will have to be able to show uh, the nation and Alaskans if they want to move forward. Okay, thank you, Representative Vance. So uh, now we'll move on to the lightning round, uh, where again, we'll ask each candidate a series of yes or no questions. Again, we're looking for a yes or a no, uh, not a maybe or any other type of answer here. So um, we'll start with Ms. Cooper. Ms. Cooper, are you getting a flu shot this year? Yes or no? I already have it, yes. Okay, uh, Representative Vance, are you getting a flu shot this year? Yes or no? No. Uh, thank you, Ms. Cooper. Do you think Alaska should pay a statutory permanent fund dividend next year, which would add more than a billion dollars to the deficit compared to this year? Yes or no? I hate yes or no's. Um, no. Okay, thank you. Representative Vance, do you think Alaska should pay a statutory permanent fund dividend next year? Yes or no? Yes. 
Thank you, Representative Vance. Uh, Representative Vance, do you support a state income tax to help fill the deficit, yes or no? No. Thank you, Ms. Cooper. Do you support a state income tax to help fill the deficit, yes or no? None at this time. Uh, thank you, Representative Vance. Have you ever visited the Russian Old Believer village of Nikolaevsk, which is in your district, yes or no? Yes. Okay, thank you, Ms. Cooper. Have you ever visited Nikolaevsk? Yes. Uh, thank you, Ms. Cooper. Have you been to the Salty Dog Saloon on the Homer Spit, which is in your district, since the COVID-19 pandemic began, yes or no? No. Thank you, Representative Vance. Have you been to the Salty Dog since the pandemic started, yes or no? No. No fun. Uh, thank you, Representative Vance. Uh, <laughs> Representative Vance, has the state parks budget been cut too far, yes or no? Uh, depends on who you talk to. Um, I don't have enough information for that to uh, give an honest answer. You're a state legislator. Answer. You have to answer yes or no here. Uh, if it's too far? Has, yeah, has it been cut too far, the state parks budget? Yes or no? Uh, at this time, no. Thank you. Ms. Co uh, Ms. Cooper, has the uh, state parks budget been cut too far? Yes or no? Yes. I didn't think that one was going to be so tough. Thank you. Um, Ms. Cooper, is uh, global warming a serious threat to the state that demands action from the legislature? Yes or no? Absolutely. Thank you. Representative Vance, is global warming a serious threat to the state that demands action from the legislature? Yes or no? Yes. Thank you. Representative Vance, do you support an amendment to the Alaska Constitution that would recognize a rural preference for subsistence? Yes or no? No. Uh, thank you. Ms. Cooper, do you support a constitutional amendment recognizing a rural subsistence preference? Yes or no? No. Thank you. Ms. Cooper, uh, did you catch a halibut this summer? Who has time to fish during a campaign? No. I'll take that as a no. Thank you. Representative Vance, did you catch a halibut this summer? Yes. Okay. Well, um, I guess Representative Vance might. Um, thank you. Representative Vance, should the legislature boost the budget for the state ferry system? Yes or no? Sorry, is that mine? Yeah. <laughs> uh, no. Okay, Ms. Cooper, should the legislature boost the budget for the state ferry? Can you clarify, are you talking about the uh, existing operating budget or The Alaska budget? Marine Highway System budget. Should it go up? Uh, yes or no, Is uh, should the budget go up? Yes. Thanks for those answers. Um, Representative Vance, Ms. Cooper, I want to thank you for being with us tonight. They're running for the District 31 House seat, uh, which represents the Southern Kenai Peninsula. Um, that's it for our program tonight. Thanks for sticking with us. And we'll be back tomorrow night at the same time for a second round of debates hosted by my colleague Andrew Kitchenman in Juneau. You can find more of our election coverage at alaskapublic.org and ktoo.org. We had production tonight from Maiwa Aina, Annie Fight, Lex Trinan, Valerie Kern, Lance Hankins, Hannah Lees, Mika Wilson, Jeff Chen, Kelly Birkinshaw, Connor Cruikshank, and Matt Fabian. I'm Nat Hers. Have a great night.